You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says that without reason that he jealous, jealously longs for the spirit? He has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace. This is what the scripture says. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will free from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You, you double-minded, grief, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, Pastor. Jennifer. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here this morning. I feel a bit like a visiting preacher, having been away for three weeks. Um, Mum is uh, making splendid progress, and she particularly wanted me to thank everyone for the prayers. So um, the infection that was in her foot has more or less gone, and um, she is um, beginning to walk a bit. So um, I actually got her up. She actually said I was a bit of a bully because I got her up um, six stairs um, yesterday. But, uh, and the new hip joint working nicely. Can I pull a bit away from that then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, I meant come. Right. All I can see is that. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Lord and loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you're our God and our King. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that um, you just want to communicate with us all the time. And we pray now, Lord, that you will communicate now. We pray, Lord, that anything that I say that's not of you will be completely forgotten and go away. But the things of you, Lord, will, um, will really root themselves in our heart. And I do pray, Lord, that you will speak to each of us wherever we are on this very practical but uh, very often difficult topic of how we avoid temptation. We pray for your guidance, your blessing, and your strength to be able to resist that temptation. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I used to love hill walking. And, um, you know, I've gone up Penny Fan. That was the last one I did. Actually, by that time, I was old, and I wished I had a second pair of lungs, but there it is. Um, I've been up Snowden. That's Snowden there, Snowden Horseshoes. And um, it's been great walking up those paths in the Lake District, wherever it may be. And then every now and again, it strikes me that um, some of the paths have sort of gone to rack and ruin. And I look at what's normally a path, and perhaps sometimes a bit of erosion. Sometimes you get a path when you're walking up that's completely destroyed. You think, how's that happened? This is a big, strong mountain. How has this happened? And sometimes you even get to rocky bits where the rocks have been completely smashed. And incredibly, it all starts with a tiny drop of rain. Um, a tiny drop of rain drops on the surface and um, makes a little splash in the um, rock. If it's on a hard rock, it'll just wash off. But if it drops down on a little bit of earth or a softer bit of rock, it makes a very, very tiny groove. And then as more rain falls on it, that groove gets a little bit deeper. And as it gets deeper, so rainwater from other areas where the rains are start to channel into it. And it starts to sort of tear out and makes a, a little channel. And if it goes unchecked, it carries on. More water goes through there. It goes faster. It rips at the rocks as it goes through. It becomes a stream, a, a gushing mountain stream. And before you know where you are, it's starting to go like the picture in the middle, that big bit of erosion on the mountainside. And in due course, it alters the mountain. It can even destroy bits of the mountain. Well, so much for um, a brief starter all about... Um, erosion caused by rainfall, but I want you to hold that in your minds, that particular picture, because actually, um, it actually says an awful lot about temptation in our lives. 
I'm not an expert at dealing with temptation, but today we're actually going to look at how to resist. It's part of the how-to series, how to resist temptation. I'm afraid I used to have a T-shirt like that. Mine was black. Um, my wife found it, and um, I, th I think it's now somewhere ov overseas where they uh, wanted T-shirts. She's not keeping that. Um, but isn't that so true for many of us, that actually... Um, you know, we can resist anything we say, and then a bit of temptation comes along, and we find we've fallen. It's so easy to fall to temptation. Um, but actually, with God's help, we can resist temptation. It's not a battle we've lost. It's a battle to be fought and won. And um, so what we're going to do today is to look at some very sort of practical things on the how-to, which is basically looking at, first of all, that sin is serious, you know, there are people who say, oh, it doesn't matter, we're forgiven. I'll come back to that in a minute. But sin is serious. But secondly, how to resist. How to resist by avoiding it. How to resist by being transformed. How to resist by taking thoughts captive. And how to resist by helping one another. So I want to begin by saying a little bit about the seriousness of sin. Now, actually, I grew up knowing about the seriousness of sin. I think my mum did a really good job on it. And um, what surprised me is many of my Christian friends as I grew up, particularly in the 60s and early 70s, didn't recognize this at all. There was a major emphasis on grace. Well, that's a good thing. But there was an overemphasis on grace. So very correctly, they knew that on the cross, Jesus died to defeat Satan, to defeat death, and to defeat sin. And when we personally accept Jesus' death for our sins and make him Lord of our lives, then our past is forgiven. Our sins are washed away. We become citizens of the kingdom of God, and we're saved for an eternity with God. You know, the technical word is we're justified sometimes we say our sins are forgiven absolutely true and it's great news and the great news of course is that the forgiveness of our sins of our self-centeredness and all our filthy past forgiveness is free Jesus has done all that needs to be done for us to be forgiven all we have to do is accept it but my Christian friends tended not to see the seriousness of sin after that. You know, many of them had the idea, great, we're saved. So actually, it doesn't really matter if we carry on singing. Um, you know, we do the odd bad thing. Well, I dare say Jesus doesn't really mind. I mean, you know, he'll continue to love us, which he does. Ah, oh, you know, he'll forgive us. So, you know, it's not hugely important. We'll, we'll try to be okay-ish but it, it really doesn't matter actually the bible is very clear that it does matter sin is serious and the bible expects us to live a kingdom lifestyle a lifestyle where we're loving god where we're obeying god where we're loving each other where we're denying self and as hebrews 12 4 says where we're making every effort to be holy or as Romans 12, 1 puts it, one of my favorite passages, that first part of Romans 12, you know, we are to be living sacrifices. We're to work with the Holy Spirit in the process of our sanctification, which means becoming more Christ-like. Yes, we foul up. I certainly foul up, and I foul up badly sometimes. Yes, we're forgiven when we confess and repent when we fouled up. But sin is still serious. It has consequences. First of all, it damages our relationship with and sometimes our usefulness to God. You know, James, writing to Christians, not to non-Christians, he's actually writing to Christians, save people, James 4.11, and he says that friendship with the system of this world makes us enemies of God. So if we're sinning, it's actually getting in the way of our relationship with God. No wonder Paul and Jesus urge the importance of a holy lifestyle. Added to that, of course, 
if we are um, habitually sinning and doing most awful things, what sort of a witness is that to the love of God and to obeying God and to living out a Christ-like lifestyle? You know, it damages our witness. Moreover, it also impacts on other people. If we steal, other people suffer loss. If we commit adultery, numerous close family, and for that matter, extended family, suffer. If we abuse, the victim can be scarred for life. If we undermine other people by what we say, if we shout at them in anger and have a go at them, we pull them down, we hurt them. Our sin clearly has consequences for other people. Moreover, when we sin, we can also open a door in our lives for Satan to get in. Now, he'll never be able to possess us or own us because we belong to God. But if we habitually sin, if we hold on to unconfessed sin, or if we hold on to anger or unforgiveness, that gives Satan a foothold. He may just sort of get into a bit of a room in our life. He may squat there. And if he does, he'll do damage. And for that matter, modern neuroscience shows that sin is bad for us. You know, when we think, when we speak, when we make a choice, when we make a decision, when we enact something, a neuronal electrochemical pathway is laid down in our brains. When we have the same thought or we um, decide to make the same choice or act in the same way, that pathway is reinforced until it becomes a default way of thinking and behaving. Very similar, you see, to that drop of rain landing on the hillside and cutting that groove in it. And in time, this goes into our subconscious. So it becomes the default way that we will act when something happens. Moreover, these pathways generate electromagnetic responses and signals which unlock genetic codes in our DNA. And that creates the proteins, the serotines, and the other chemicals which have a huge impact on the shape of our brain, the structure of our brain, and also our spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical well-being. So, as you can imagine... If the neuronal pathways are good, if they're godly, we'll become more Christ-like. We'll conform to our original design, and we will actually have well-being. That well-being covering our spiritual side, but also our mental, our physical, our emotional side as well. But if those thoughts, those decisions are toxic, if they're sinful, we call it, if they're not going God's way, if they're negative if they're self-centered or worldly, then we will damage God's work in us and our relationship with him and our well-being and our characters. So sin has a big impact on us. Sin is serious, which is why when we're tempted to sin, really important that we work at saying, no, I will not be tempted to sin. Well, if the temptation comes, I will not sin. Now, you would have thought, I would have thought, that actually it was easy to decide, therefore, to go God's way, because that's in our best interest and everyone else's best interest, and therefore not fall into temptation. But actually, I don't know about you, but I certainly know with me, it is an incredible battle. You know, we all face, I think, I certainly do, constant temptation to go our own way and not God's way. You know, there's propaganda which is pushing its way at us. There's peer pressure hammering away at us. Come on, everyone does it. Don't be the odd one out. There's social pressure from a world system that is running in opposition to God and his rule. And we read that in 1 John 2.16. We also face temptation from within ourselves you know, it's our self-centeredness, which Paul calls the old man in Galatians 5.17 and 6, seven to 8. And um, the old man within us encourages us to put comfort first, our self-interest first, before God's interests. 
And, you know, we get to that point where we want to control things and others for our own pleasure and where we think it's important to depend on material things. So that's another huge pressure. And I know, I don't know if you know what that's like. I certainly know what that, that is like. And it's hard work facing those temptations. Then there's Satan. Satan coming along and using those things to really get in. And persuading us that our choices are actually reasonable. Oh, it's quite reasonable. Put yourself first. Come on, you know. It's the way you're designed, isn't it? Says Satan. Oh, it's perfectly natural to do those things. Don't worry. Everyone does it. And anyway, surely a loving God won't mind, you know. He had those thoughts. Yeah. We're in a battle. That's what it's about. It's a real battle. And even Paul, you know, we think of St. Paul, a wonderful, saintly spiritual man. Even he said that the good he wanted to do, he didn't. And the bad that he hated, he did. You read it in Romans 7, 15 to 19. Really difficult. And sometimes we feel that our whole selves are a bit like that um, Disney cartoon there, which I think came out about 1938, where um, a cat, was thrown down a well um, by Pluto. And um, Pluto's good self and Pluto's bad self uh, come along and argue out whether he should leave the cat in the well or fetch it out. And you know, the good self is saying, oh, I don't know why they put this silly voice on. I think it's holy, but, you know, oh, Pluto, do the right thing and get the little kitty out. And the other one, the other one says, no, keep him in the well. You know, and on it goes. Uh, you know, we laugh at that, but isn't that sometimes what it's like in our lives? That battle that goes on against temptation. But scripture is absolutely clear. We are to fight back against temptation to sin. You know, James put it like this in James uh, 4, 7. Resist the devil and he will flee. So if we resist, we will be successful. And Peter tells us in, um, this is 1 Peter 5, 9, he tells us to resist the devil standing firm in the faith. It's great. We can do that. But practically, how do we go about it? Pra because I fall over so often and fall to temptation. So how do we go about trying to sort that out? The first thing is to resist temptation by avoiding it. You know, our mountain would have suffered no erosion whatsoever if we could have picked up that mountain and taken it away from where the rain was dropping. Okay, that's bonkers. You can't do that with mountains. But in terms of our minds, in terms of our brains, uh, they won't have had temptation dropping on them if we could have avoided the temptation situation in the very beginning. Now, obviously, we can't do that all the time. Obviously, we can't avoid the world completely. You know, some of the uh, medieval hermits used to go into a cave and sit in there and, uh, you know, um, pray and what have you, which is wonderful. And they thought, right, we've cast the world away from us. We can be sinless. Uh, I don't think it quite worked like that. Added to which, Jesus wants us in the world. We're to be salt and light. We're actually to have an impact on the world for Christ. But we're not to be controlled by it. We're not to fall in the ways of the world. It's very clear in uh, Matthew 5, 13 to 16. But it is a biblical strategy to avoid temptation when we can. You know, one of Jesus' favorite sayings, it comes three times and they're not actually parallel passages, um, is where he's talking about sin and then he talks about our reaction to it. And he tells us to gouge out our eyes, cut off our hands, and cut off our feet if these body parts are causing us to sin. You find it in Matthew 5, 29 to 30, 18, 8 to 9, and in Mark 9, 47. Obviously, it was important to him that he mentioned it so often. Now, some early readers, I don't know whether the listeners did at the time, but certainly some early readers of these passages took them very, very literally. They ended up blinding themselves. One early bishop ended up um, emasculating himself because he had sexual thoughts. He thought, well, that's bad. I'd better cut off things that might give me those sexual thoughts. 
I think they failed to recognise a couple of things. First of all, actually, it's not the eye or the foot or the hand that causes you to sin. It's your mind inside making the decision. They're merely the channels that have put you in that situation or position. And secondly, that when saying this, Jesus was using a very typically Jewish word picture, and that was a means of hammering home a really important truth. So what is he actually saying? What he's saying is that if we look at something and that causes us so much temptation that we sin, we should act as if our eye had been torn out. In other words, don't go and look at it. If where we go causes us so much temptation that we sin, we should act as if our foot was cut off so we couldn't go there, so we weren't able to get in that position where we would sin. And if it's what we do, then we should act as if our hand has been cut off, so actually we won't do it, and therefore we won't be in that situation where we might sin. Sometimes think of people who uh, tell me they're absolutely addicted to porn, and you say to them, okay, so how does this happen? They say, well, when I sit at my computer, and then I switch it on, okay, don't sit at the computer. You know, don't put your hand on that keyboard. Act as if your hand's been cut off or your foot's been cut off so you haven't gone up to the computer. It, that's what Jesus is basically saying. And actually, it's really clear, practical advice. I mean, to be honest, if when I walked home, I always walked down a particular alleyway and halfway down, I got set upon by a band of desperados who beat me up, stole my wallet and then um, left me there and ran off. And it happened night after night. Wouldn't I choose a different way of going home? Similarly, if I know that I'm doing something, or I'm seeing something, or I'm going somewhere that causes me to sin, surely I should choose to do something, see something, or go somewhere else. Do it differently, so we're not in that sin-tempting uh, position. So Jesus is basically saying... If you want to avoid sex outside marriage, don't look at sexually explicit films. Don't get into pornography. Don't go to strip clubs. Don't flirt dangerously. Don't dress inappropriately. Don't send out the wrong signals. Don't start misbehaving at office parties. All this puts you into the path of temptation to sin. And if you've got a problem with alcohol, well, don't hang around in the alcohol aisle at the local supermarket. You know, ooh, that looks like a quite old bottle of wine. Ooh, I wonder what it tastes. No good to you if you're an alcoholic. And don't go down the pub and say, ooh, that you know, pint of bitter smells good, doesn't it? It won't do you any good at all. Or if you've got a problem with gluttony, don't cook huge meals. You know, cook small meals so when you arrive at the table, there's just a small amount to eat. Uh, otherwise, you just keep saying, oh, there's a bit left. I better have that. Or don't drive past the bakery on your way home. <laughs> you know, you think, mm, perhaps one cake won't. But blah, 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 blah. perhaps a couple. Perhaps I'll take a few for perhaps the next few weeks. And, you know. I think a very good example of trying to avoid this was um, in one of Adrian Plass's books where um, his neighbour's godly wife uh, was seeing another man on her morning commute. He was just another passenger in the, uh, in the railway carriage. And after many months, you know, they smiled, good morning, and uh, you know how particularly English people are, you, you don't talk to anyone. Uh, but after six months or more, they started just to say good morning and smile. And then after a bit, they chatted a little bit. And then she found that she was looking forward to seeing him and they'd have a little chat on the way in. And then she found that as time went on, if for any reason he wasn't there, she felt really down and miserable. And then she began to realise that she was slowly falling in love with this person. And she didn't know what to do. So she didn't want to get emotionally attached, but it was happening. And so she said to her husband in the book, what shall I do? This is what's happening. And apparently, he, he was a pipe smoker. I'm not recommending that. Um, but... He puffed on his pipe a couple of times and he looked at her and he said, if I were you, I'd get the next train. 
really sound advice. You know, get yourself away from the sin, or the temptation, and you probably won't sin. So avoiding temptation where possible is a very practical, a very, um, very practical way of dealing with this. I mean, to be honest, if we want to go swimming, you wouldn't dive into a leech-infested pool and hope to come out without leeches on you, because bad luck, you'll have the leeches. No, you find a clean pool to swim in. It's the same with our lives. So, first recommendation is don't go where temptation to sin is strong, if at all possible. The second is to resist temptation by being transformed. And actually, if we go to that Romans passage, by be being transformed, it's an ongoing thing. Very difficult to transform a mountain. But if you could have transformed the mountain into a waterproof structure, or you could have made the weaker bits extremely strong, reinforced concrete or whatever, I don't know, the raindrops would have had very limited impact. Okay, once again, a bit bonkers when we're thinking about mountains, but actually an important point when thinking about our minds as we respond to temptation. In this light, Paul urges us to be being continually transformed by the renewal of our minds. Find that Romans 12, 1 to 2. Now, as we know, and we mentioned earlier, our thought processes, and for that matter, our experiences, even our genes, pattern and wire our brains to predispose us to particular attitudes and decisions. You know, if we've had negative experiences, poor genes passed on, or are worldly, controlled by influences from our society or our fallen nature, um, we allow those sorts of um, things to come into our minds, we're more likely to succumb to temptation. The good news is that God has so designed us that it doesn't have to be that way. We can change. Because God's made our brains and minds in such a way that they can be changed. And that's called neuroplasticity. And by changing our thoughts, by changing our responses, by changing our actions and our choices, we change the very structure of our brains and minds. In fact, the very structure of ourselves. That's why in Proverbs 23.7, uh, the writer writes, As he thinks within himself, so is he. We are therefore able to be transformed to be more Christ-like. And if we're more Christ-like, we have a greater propensity to resist temptation. Indeed, actually, you think about it, it's pretty rare for someone with a really pure heart to do some dreadful sin. But someone who um, you know, really hasn't got a pure heart at all, well, very easy to fall into sin. So, what to do? I think we need first to stop acting and thinking as the world does and as our self-centred attitudes dictate. You know, in Matthew 16, 21 and Luke 9, 23, Jesus tells us to die to self and to self-centred ways. You know, Paul tells the Roman Christians not to accept the values, the influences, the thought patterns of this age in Romans 12, 2. And he says to the Colossians that we're to put away old thought patterns of impurity, lust, evil desires, fornication, covetousness, greed, anger, lies, malice. Colossians 3, um, 5 onwards. You know, getting rid of what Paul sometimes calls the old man helps our brains repattern and be less receptive to temptation to sin. Again, um, I was reading the other day, Joyce Meyer, uh, writing of an adulterous womanizer who uh, tried to save his marriage. He didn't want to keep sleeping with other women, but kept finding he did. And he prayed hard about it, but still it carried on. And when questioned eventually, he admitted that he was not only addicted to pornography, but in his mind he was having sex with the women that he was looking at in his pornography. And he couldn't understand why he still felt tempted to sleep with women and still did. He needed to change. 
and be transformed. And so we need to put off old attitudes and not conform to the attitudes and influences of this world. But it's not just about putting off, it's also about putting on. We need to start thinking and acting as God does and putting on new attitudes. You know, Paul talks of it in the light of putting on new clothes or a new self, Ephesians 4.24, Colossians 3.9-10. And Peter talks about us participating in the divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4. That's wonderful, isn't it? It's a choice. It's a choice for us to take. It doesn't come automatically. And again, the Hebrews 12.4 passage says, make every effort to be holy. And Paul urges us to be living sacrifices by living a holy life, pleasing to God. So, of course, it's about yielding ourselves to God and allowing his Holy Spirit to work in us. James, in uh, the passage we had read earlier, James 4, 7 to 8, tells us to submit to God, as does Peter, 1 Peter 5, 6. Paul tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. And filled in the Greek there has the meaning of being controlled by the Holy Spirit. So again, it's yielding ourselves, taking our hands off the tiller of our life, if you like, and saying to the Holy Spirit, come on, you direct my life and I'll follow. It's obeying the Holy Spirit, yielding to his guidance and lordship. And he enables our minds to be repatterned and for us to become more Christ-like. And in part, the Holy Spirit does this by using scripture. He enlivens the Bible. You know, when we read God's word in the Bible, when we spend time in it, when we meditate on it, when we memorize it, when we think about it, when we meet God through it and see him in action through it, we will understand God better and be able to judge our thoughts and our actions against his standards. Um, as Hebrews 4.12 shows us, we'll be able to see whether a particular thought, a particular decision is honouring to God, is what God wills or not. But more than that, the Spirit also uses that to generate thoughts in our minds which are in line with God's thoughts and our minds become repatterned and therefore we become transformed by the renewing of our minds. You know, it's really not surprising, is it, that uh, the Israelites were encouraged to meditate day and night on the word of God. That's Joshua 1.8. And Paul encouraged us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Colossians 3.16. You know, we're in a much, much stronger position to resist temptation if we avoid it and if we have a transformed mind. But what about when temptation still comes in? And again, we rely on Paul here. He talks about resisting temptation by taking thoughts captive. And this is a bit like, you know, the rainwater's coming down. It's starting to cut a channel. And actually, we don't want it to damage the mountain of our life. What we do is we dam it and we divert it into a different channel. So basically, it's stopping tempting thoughts and refocusing them so we repattern our brain as Jesus wants. So rather than allowing temptation to lead us to sin, we're to discipline our thought lives and turn temptations into positives. Now, yeah, we're going to face huge issues, huge pressures to conform to the world, um, we may have an inbuilt propensity to sin, but no one, not even Satan, can force us to sin. We always have choice. We've got a choice whether to serve God or not. You know, Joshua 24, Matthew 6 makes that very, very clear. We've got a choice on what and how we think. Paul makes that clear in Colossians 3. How to act. We've got a choice on whether to resist the devil or not. We've got a choice whether to submit to and come, come close to God or not. We have that choice. And there's also a choice on how to respond to temptation. And what Paul suggests is that we take every thought, including the tempting thoughts, capture. 
and make them obedient to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.5. Well, first of all, we need to stop, take the thought that comes in and evaluate it and see if it measures up to God's standards. Will the particular decision I'm thinking of taking, the particular action that I'm doing, the particular way I'm thinking, will that honour God? Will that show love to him? Will that show love to others? Will it promote the gospel? And for that matter, what would Jesus do in this situation that I'm in now? And if those thoughts or intended actions fail that test, then we need to reject them. And that's like building a dam, as I say, close to where the raindrops are beginning to cause a bit of erosion and stopping the water flow. In brain pattern terms, it's stopping reinforcing bad neuronic pathways and eventually, if not used, those bad pathways disappear. But just saying no is sometimes very hard. And I don't know about you, but when people say no, don't do X, Y, and Z, it makes you focus on the very thing they said don't do. You know, um, when somebody says to people, don't smoke, they immediately start thinking of cigarettes, and then they think, oh, I did like my last cigarette. You know, how anyone likes a cigarette, I don't know, but there it is. Um, some people do, and it makes them think about it, and then, then they start yearning for it. Bad news. It's the same in school. We used to say to staff, you know, don't say to a kid, you know, uh, don't fiddle about with your pencil, because in their minds is pencil. Rather, you change things to, um, I need you to be getting on with that. Um, what are you going to be writing about? Much, much better, um, because you... Um, diverted it without getting them to think about pencil and I can play with it. If I said to you now, um, I want you all to think about a pink panther, you know, coming in, that long slinky tail and that, yeah, you can think about it now. And I then said, by the way, I don't want you to think about that pink panther anymore. Every time I said, don't think about the pink panther, you'd be, oh yes, I remember that pink panther, you know. And so those things stick in our minds. And the skill is to refocus, because otherwise our tempting thoughts will still be buzzing about there. So with tempting thoughts, we need to capture them. So we pause and reflect on what am I doing, what am I thinking about. We evaluate them, and then we refocus. And the way of refocusing is to replace them, quite logically, with godly thoughts. Very often using God's word. And that is not only damming the raindrop, but as I said, um, diverting the stream into where it's good, and where we want it to be. And the best way of doing this is learning certain Bible verses which we can bring into our heads when a tempting thought comes. So if I struggle with anger, I might think of James 1, 19 to 20, telling me to be slow to anger and speak, but quick to hear. And that means that my thought about anger is turned into a focus on the importance of listening. So I'm no longer focusing on the temptation, but actually on things above, we've been told to listen. A similar passage could be Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, where we're told to get rid of all bitterness, anger and malice, and are reminded to focus on kindness, compassion, mutual forgiveness, just as in Christ God forgave us. So from angry thoughts, we don't sin. Instead, we think about forgiveness, and then we meditate on Jesus' sacrifice and his love for us, and the anger goes away. If I struggle with lust, I can remember that God created sex as a good thing, and I can praise him for his creation and good gifts, for things noble and pure, and then I can think about Philippians 4, 8. For me... Um, when I, um, this is confession time, I'm afraid, when I see Christians being murdered, sometimes rising up within me is a bit like, remember the first line of Milton's bit of poetry when a whole lot of Christians were massacred somewhere? He said, defend, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, you know, rise up, crush down the... And actually, I need, when I think like that, to have this particular verse, which I love, it means a lot to me, Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, which is, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. And it goes on to say that God's ways are higher and better than mine. And 
as soon as I start getting uptight, that, thankfully, because I've done it often enough, starts to flicker into my mind. Like, Absolutely, Lord, you're right. You're right. And they need to calm down and love people, not, not condemn them. And that certainly always works for me. And Jesus, in some ways, did much the same about this refocusing in the wilderness. Luke 4, 3 to 13. When Satan tries to make him break his fast by focusing on food, he actually moves it using scripture to focus on God's word. When Satan then goes on to say, well, you can have recognition and power, Jesus takes that and uses scripture to focus on worshipping and serving God. So a very good example. If Jesus did it and it worked, I think that's a really good way for us to. You know, in this way, we control our thinking, we reject temptation to sin, and we refocus ourselves on what helps us to get closer to God. And the more we do it, the more second nature it becomes. So three ways so far of defeating temptation. Rather more briefly, another way is resisting temptation by helping each other. You know, we are so valuable to each other. And it's worth mentioning fellowship and mutual support in resisting temptation. Now, with all the influences that get hammered to us outside, our non-Christian friends, the way society is, the world system itself, it's so important to have a group of supportive, loving, non-judgmental, like-minded people with whom to share, with whom to pray, and from whom to receive support, and for the matter, to give support to as well. Because otherwise, temptation can overcome us. One person on their own can be knocked flat, you know, several people together are going to stand firm. Best example I've got of that is when I was at King's London as an undergrad. And um, I was, uh, first of all, uh, in the cross-country team. I ended up in the rugby team. And I was the sports representative on the um, union. So all the people I mixed with were sort of heavy drinking, sport playing, what have you. And it would have been very easy for me to start thinking, perhaps I'm the odd one out, perhaps there's something wrong with me. Thankfully, I had a large number of friends who were in the Christian Union, and um, so spending time with them in the Bible studies in Hall and uh, places like that meant that I was thinking, no, I'm not a weirdo, and therefore I probably need to change. No, I'm like these other Christians, and therefore I need to stay as I am, and that's the way of God. That was invaluable to me. And actually, sharing with each other and helping each other, and supporting each other, being open with each other, and non-judgmental with each other, but being supportive, is so important. You know, no wonder um, the writer of the Hebrews urges Christians not to neglect to meet together, but to meet and encourage each other, it's Hebrews 10, 26. So when we feel temptation coming at us, it's so worthwhile sharing with each other. And the support, love, Examples, advice and prayer from each other really do help us resist temptation. So, we know that sin is deadly serious and that we are called to stand for Christ in this alien world despite the fiery darts of the enemy, despite the pressures from our old inner man. I, I suppose there's an inner woman too. Um, and despite the temptations and pressures of the world around us. As our mountain example shows, we can start by trying to avoid temptation to sin, not even letting it come near us. We can also be working with the Holy Spirit to transform our minds so that even if temptation comes, we are less likely to fall to it. Because we know God's word. We know what God wants. It's second nature to us. We've got control over our lives through the Holy Spirit, who is actually guiding and leading it. And we're strong in areas where we once were weak. And we work alongside the Holy Spirit to make the right choices, allowing him to use scripture and godly thoughts to repattern us for Christ. 
And when temptations still come, we're encouraged to think about and reflect on our thoughts and possible decisions, to evaluate them, to see if they honour God and they are in line with his will. Those that are not, as I said, we reject like building a dam on the mountainside and we refocus our thoughts using scripture, redirecting. And in this way, we won't be sinning, nor will we be focusing on the temptation, but we'll end up focusing on godly things and on praising him. And finally, of course, we can support each other. So I'm hoping that some of these practical ideas will be helpful in our daily, should I say hourly, minute by minute battle with temptation. And I'm sure that we'll still stumble, we'll still fall on occasion. I certainly do. But with doing some of what we've talked about this morning, I'm equally sure we'll overcome temptation on many occasions. And as we do, we'll become holier in our lifestyle. We'll become more like Jesus. And as we do this and reflect him in our character, we will be making Jesus too big to ignore. Amen. Amen. Wow. I, I strongly advise you to get in the...